hello i thank you for all of these lovely welcome messages and what a privilege it is to be here tonight introducing feminism for women by the one and only julie bindle who is a journalist author feminist activist and if i may say so a total powerhouse who has campaigned against male violence against women and girls since the age of 17. Julie has written extensively on rape, domestic violence, sexually motivated murder, prostitution and trafficking, child sexual exploitation, stalking and the rise of religious fundamentalism and its harm to women and girls. And she has now written this book, bringing her feminist politics to a new generation of readers. Welcome, Julie, and thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Thank you, Claire, and it's it's really an honour to have you convening this event and to be in conversation with you and right back at you about the powerhouse thing. Oh, that's and, uh, really lovely. Ho hope you really like my my new sexy croaky voice. I'm afraid I have COVID, but none of you are going to catch it from me tonight. <laughs> <laughs> that's the that good thing. That is the magic of having this online. Yep. <laughs> but oh my goodness, like, see, if you had told me, like, I first discovered your work during my gender studies course where Straight Expectations was on the reading list and it blew my mind because it was one of the first contemporary books I'd re read by somebody who was proud to be a lesbian. And see if you'd told me then that one day I would be hosting your online book launch, it would have blown my mind. Well, you know, I'm really pleased that you've given Straight Expectations so much love and and also that you're a lesbian with politics who <laughs> has looked at what we mean by political lesbianism in an intelligent and nuanced way. So that, as you know, um, the rumour has it or the distortion of of the meaning has it that straight women decide that to punish men and to be better feminists. Um, they give up sex with men that they really enjoy and force themselves <laughs> to be lesbians. Um, and the, the, the arguments go like this. Um, how dare they tell us, real lesbians who were born that way, that you can just identify as a lesbian? Well, we don't, we don't say that at all. We're very clear that, uh, and this is what I wrote about in Straight Expectations and I write about it in Feminism for Women, what we mean is that there is um, a very important analysis to be made about heterosexuality and compulsory heterosexuality and how women are railroaded into it. And that if we really did have a free choice, many more women would very happily and actively choose um, to reject men sexually because they have no interest and no sexual desire for them and open themselves up to the possibility of um, intimacy with women um, and so so what I'm arguing is that there is no gay gene as such but that women are railroaded into straight relationships and that those of us that are lesbians and love the fact that we're lesbians um, and no wouldn't take a pill to cure us of our lesbianism which was something in the 70s I used to be asked by people all the time yeah but wouldn't you take the pill if oh it makes God. you and I would say, well, no, obviously, because it's great being a lesbian. Um, and so that's that's what we, I mean, one of the things that we share, isn't it, is the fact that we are extremely proud and pleased uh, that we're lesbians. And I can't believe that this is such a kind of out there sentiment. Why wouldn't women think this is the greatest thing on earth? Absolutely. Um, I'm pretty sure I would rather die than take that hypothetical pill and become heterosexual. No offence to any of the straight women watching this, but I've tried it. It's not for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> but with feminism for women, um, there were many things I liked about this book, but in particular, I thought you gave on page 17 a really excellent definition of compulsory heterosexuality. And I think you unpacked, you challenged a lot of the kind of stereotypes around the idea of political lesbianism and what it means, an idea of women being forced to be lesbians. And 
what made it so powerful I think was the way you looked at context because you said it's not just about women being physically coerced into sexual relationships with men such as forced marriage or corrective rape it's about the mechanisms by which women themselves come to desire those relationships in order to be valued by men deemed attractive by men protected by men and ultimately accepted by other women in society. I thought that was absolutely brilliant. Well, I mean, thank you. And, and something I think really interesting has happened in the way that heterosexuality um, has, has come to permeate the consciousness of those liberals that consider themselves to be very open-minded and would never say anything overtly anti-lesbian or gay, which is the thing about children. So as a, a 59 year old woman living in North London um, with you know, a privileged career in the media and therefore some protection, definitely not fully protected, but some protection from anti-lesbianism, um, I find that I'm more stigmatized in some ways for not having children and for happily having chosen not to have children. So the term childless, I find really offensive. Uh, not of course for women to use that to describe themselves, that's absolutely uh, their prerogative. But the idea that that's imposed upon those of us that had and have no desire whatsoever for children. And I think in some ways that's replaced the prejudice amongst the liberal elite towards lesbians. Um, so they no longer think that we're a threat at all because the likes of Stonewall um, have just sought sameness with heterosexuals. So they've defanged lesbianism to the point of where it's kind of, let's just be the same as them. We want everything they have. Well, I definitely don't. All that campaigning for marriage, when we used to as feminists campaign to abolish marriage as an institution, um, and then, of course, you know, the kind of normalization um, of, of surrogacy, the creeping normalization of surrogacy, even for some lesbians. Um, and, and I think now that's a measure of whether we're proper human beings or not. So we can be in a same sex couple because, after all, we're no threat to anyone. We're just partnered up and living in our houses with a marriage certificate and um and kids but but if you kind of deviate from that pattern we, we really do then feel um the disapproval i think because we're still we are outsiders and so we should be by which i mean we should be a challenge to heterosexuality as an institution we should make people think about what heterosexuality is in the way that i as a, a white person uh, used to just think white was the default position and I didn't consider myself white until you know I got some level of education about that so I, so I hope that heterosexual women and I know there are many many happy heterosexual women with good blokes in good relationships but I do hope we can somehow get back to having that feminist critique of of sexuality which we've we've lost in recent decades absolutely I think um there are so many radical possibilities within lesbian life and it does seem really disappointing when you highlight that that we've gone with the stonewall kind of equality route rather than liberatory possibilities it just seems a bit of a wasted opportunity and it's mirrored in feminist politics also because of course what i try to do in the book is to say look you know most of you reading that you, you you may in the main be heterosexuals reading it if i'm lucky enough to have you know you reading it um but don't think that the stuff about lesbian politics is irrelevant to you because it's reflective of how women are treated in any society it's a bit like how women in prostitution are treated in any society look at that and look at the levels of misogyny that's that's inherent so so men clearly, the biggest threat to men is uh, our refusal to acquiesce, to capitulate. And 
and that they take that very, very badly, as we know from the murder rates of women who try to leave men in violent relationships um, and the other punishments women get for rejecting men sexually. So lesbians are a real challenge to that. But in, in, in the one sense, the stonewall politics of sameness and equality, um, the same as the heterosexuals has been played out. We've also seen that in feminism, organizations like the Fawcett Society, um, you know, who I'm sure have done good work in highlighting um, unequal pay. Um, it's, it's very much though, in my view, a glass ceiling organization. So it, it doesn't care as much for women in the basement as it does, you know, at the glass ceiling and many women don't earn money at all to be equal to men in the first place. But, but feminism has gone the, the equality way which is, we just want everyone to be equal, but equal to who, equal to what? To be equal to something, you have to have a default position, don't you? So when Billy Bragg um, said, surely feminism is just about equality for all. He was talking about feminists like me and you that say, we absolutely are against bigotry and discrimination towards trans people, but what we will not accept is a clash of rights and our rights being removed so that natal males can be given our rights. And he took offense at that and said equality should be for everyone, but how can everyone be equal? I don't understand. So, so equal to what? Mm. So, so that's so why society that's so fundamentally defined by hierarchies of race and class and sex and everything equality exactly. is impossible in that landscape exactly uh, and and what would that equality look like so you've got equal societies on paper some of the nordic countries that have 50 50 of pretty much everything you know female mps equal pay, et cetera, and shocking levels of sexual violence and pornography use like, like we have here and, and in, in countries around the global north and the global south. And just imagining, thinking that the job is done because you have 50% judges in a, in a court, 50% female politicians. Well, the men are going to shout louder. The men are going to be listened to more. The men are going to have more confidence. So equality doesn't work for women and it never will because it means that we will have to accept the status quo. And that's where feminism has been going, that we beg for a seat at the table instead of smashing the fucker up and saying, this table does not work for us. We're building our own. And that's what liberatory, that's what liberation feminism is about. Absolutely. I think... Oh, feminism shifted in so many different ways, and a lot of these, um, a lot of these changes are often framed as being primarily a generational conflict rather than an ideological one. What do you think? Well, I was doing an event yesterday um, for Tortoise Media, which you can you can have a look at on YouTube if you fancy an hour's discussion about feminism. That's with someone who. Um, you know, we respectfully disagree with each other. And it was a live small audience in the newsroom and it was live streamed. And so we, we got to um, some really interesting issues about generational differences. And one was, of course, um, you know, that, that there's always the two most prevailing issues. One is prostitution, which younger generations of people have been trained to uh, refer to as sex work because they've been told that it, it dignifies the women and it removes the stigma from the women, which of course neither happens. And the other is transgender ideology. I'm not talking about transgender people, I'm talking about transgender ideology. And there's something that I write in the book about um, the way that we had to, when I became a feminist, fight to reclaim the word woman because we were of course referred to as ladies. And I know many women, including myself, still struggle with using the word woman to refer in the first person to someone who might be elderly from a particular generation or class background who thinks that the word woman is rude. So we, we stopped, we, we, we protested the word girl and we protested the word woman as lady and proudly reclaim woman. And of course now it's in danger of being taken away from us 
um, by the extreme um, transgender um, ideologues um, who want to refer to us as menstruators and chest feeding and the like. And there was a question to the audience from the chair, who finds this language offensive? You know, the chest feeding and the pregnant person. And most people put, put up their hands. But the three that said very clearly that they didn't find it offensive were all in their 20s. And it's, it's easy. And, and, and when we talked about this, um, it was almost simply like, well, because it's inclusive, the language is inclusive, but obviously it's exclusive of women. Um, that, but we've been deprioritized. And it did remind me of when I, I took part on Woman's Hour a couple of years ago on one of the debates about this issue. And I was debating with um, the editor of Diva, Linda Riley, who takes a very kind of pro-transgender ideology stance. And of course, I'm sure you know my position on that. Um, and I have to say, it wasn't a difficult job. I definitely did win the argument. I definitely, definitely did. Resoundingly so, to the point where I felt a bit mean. And <laughs> I went, went into the green room and there were some young women sitting there waiting to go on for the next item. And they said, oh, that was a fascinating discussion. And I said to them, oh, great, glad you enjoyed it. What, what was your opinion? And they said, well, of course we agree with your opponent, uh, but it was still great. And I said, oh, okay, tell me, tell me how come. And they said, well, because people of our age do. And then, of course, and of course, Claire, you are that age. I um, am. <laughs> so you will know all the young women who will anonymously get in contact or get in contact and say, don't use my name or let's just talk mm. privately, who are saying they don't agree with this stuff, but they're not safe to say it because they'll lose their friendship networks and they'll be punished in their feminist societies or LGBTQQIA plus two spirit whatever um so uh so i don't think it's generational i think it's ideological and i think that the many young women who do talk about sex work being empowering and that men with penises hanging out are no issue at all in changing rooms i don't think they're feminists i hope they become feminists but that's not feminism and i'd love to be able to to talk to each and every one of them mm. I don't sure. know what's going on for them. It's um, it's difficult because you touched upon the issue of friendship groups, but really, it extends much further than that. Like community work opportunity, it um, the cost attached, I think, to taking an even vaguely critical stance on this issue, is so wildly disproportionate that it really hems a lot of young women in. And I don't really know how we get beyond that. I mean, for me, I certainly couldn't have stayed vocal about this issue without the friendship and support of lesbian feminists such as you and women, broadly speaking, of your generation. And so it is quite important to me that we build that intergenerational solidarity. And I think it's important to you too. It really is because every time I talk to, to young women, um, I mean, younger women, but particularly women in, in the twenties or even earlier as I've been doing now for a long time over Zoom calls, um, because they're not allowed to invite me to their universities, for example, I learn something really profound and important. And it's so important to look at the lives of young women now as being very different in many ways to mine when I was in my 20s, because of course we had no social media, we had no instant communication, we had no mobile phones, we had no Wi-Fi, we had nothing um, it, like that. And so organizing was very different and communication was very different. And of course the porn industry, um, which I was campaigning about right from the early 1980s, um, was so completely different. I mean, it was, it was hellish then, um, mm. but of course it's incomparable to now. And, you know, porn is driving technology as opposed to the other way around. So I learn from young women all the time and I don't expect things to ever go back to how things were because you can't. You have to move on and we have to find new ways to organise. So that's what I'm learning all the time. But I'm also learning about the way insidious bullying works and that kind of the, the, the pressure that young feminists today are under 
which is very different because of course the pressure I was under was from the men's rights movement and from violent and abusive unreconstructed sexist dinosaurs and young women today are in a much more complicated situation because the threats to them as well as all the violent bastards on the right and the like are coming from pro so-called progressive men that mm. claim to be their allies and call themselves feminists so it is really important that we keep having these conversations and and I talked to a lot of young women for my book and honestly so many of them told me exactly the same story about how their instincts told them that all the stuff that's supposed to be liberating and empowering actually isn't and of course you know they um they're getting stronger because of well, feminists like you who who are actually standing up at great personal cost Claire I know that and speaking out and hopefully from older feminists because when I when I met feminists in Leeds and I was 17 they were all about 15 years older than me and they looked after me and they mentored me and they got absolutely on my nerves at times I resented the hell out of them sometimes but I grew under their wings and we've lost the ability to mentor each other in ways that we should we're a movement we should be mentoring each other and not patronizing young women but standing in front of them and taking a bullet or just reaching out and saying what we're here don't mistrust us we're not your mom right what can we do how can we support you mm, that's a really beautiful way of putting it absolutely and it's also something you explore in depth with great compassion in the book and there was I think in the introduction you said as feminists we are sick of the differences between women being rammed down our throats and used to divide us and this this was something I thought really quite deeply about as I read it because on one level I felt a little bit defensive because I feel like it is quite a struggle to have the anti-racist aspect of black feminism heard within the mainstream movement but at the same time I absolutely got what you were saying because even like we're both lesbian feminists but at the same time you're white white and working class and I'm black and middle class and like there are a lot of people mostly men outside the movement who would say that those things should come between us but they absolutely don't and I would say well we get on like a house on fire and I think I just wish more younger and older women had contexts where it was easier to connect with each other because platforms like social media in particular can be really adversarial. Yes and it's interesting isn't it that lots of white male um, self-identified socialists seem to have taken such an interest in intersectional feminism of mm. late and my god are they bending over backwards to make sure that they have all their ducks in a row about this when traditionally the, the, the broad left has paid little attention to structural oppression outside of the workerist issues that they deal with, little attention to race um, and in fact even class if you look at the way that Jeremy Corbyn and his posh henchmen um, you know, were, were patronizing and talking down to working class labor voters that were wavering mm -hmm. as though their, their actual lived experience didn't matter. Sound familiar at all? <laughs> and, and yet at the same time, and feminists are hardly perfect at this, but I think that the women's movement is a part of the left that has actually made attempts, sometimes failed, sometimes not good enough, often not good enough, but really thorough attempts at dealing with class, of dealing with issues of racism, uh, imperialism, ethnicity, um, in the way that we have understood certain aspects of male violence to adversely affect particular groups of women, and having to also educate, and I'm talking about white feminists here, not capital W, capital F, 
you know yeah yeah feminists who are white um who have I think come a long way in understanding that cultural relativism you know FGM happens over there forced marriage happens to those women really um moved forward um in ways that men on the left have not men on the left still defending some practices um facing women living um under islamic laws that are horrendous for example and leftist men supporting the sex trade which of course primarily affects in the worst ways native indigenous women of color black women um poor women impoverished women women leaving care women being snatched from reservations i mean just the most disenfranchised women they're supporting those industries so although it, it, you know i do touch upon this in the book in the 80s we went through a terrible time with identity politics becoming absolutely ridiculous there is an example of a conference about fat liberation where one woman was turned away from it because she was not seen to be fat enough I kid you not, where it just went ridiculous to the point of when you opened your mouth to speak at a meeting. And by the time you'd said all of the things, you know, I'm actually a black, Jewish, working class, but by the time you got to the end of your identity list, there was no time for the themes. But now we're in a situation where we have the a rerun of identity politics, but without the politics at all. And the identities are actually just individual pointless identities like being polyamorous, pansexual, um, non-binary, and nothing at all related to, to anything structural. It's a lot of looking inwards, I think, analysing the individual meaning of an identity rather than considering its social or economic implications. and. I definitely think you're right, something significant has been lost in the way in terms of politics. But just to bring you back to something you said about intersectionality, this was one of my favorite aspects of the book and I would be remiss in failing to mention it. Um, you talked about intersectionality as a lens which we should use to analyze the sex industry, highlighting that issues of race, class and imperialism all highlight, all exacerbate women's vulnerability to, men, to men's violence. And I thought that was actually one of the most interesting and on the money uses of intersectionality as a political tool that I've encountered in quite a while. Well, I've been privileged enough to travel much of the world, um, meeting women who are sex trade survivors meeting women who are actually in brothels, um, talking to women in all aspects uh, of prostitution, whether it's um, escorting, as is a kind of sanitized um, euphemistic term for, for prostitution in, in hotels, it, on street, um, in legal brothels, in illegal brothels. And, you know, so many of the women have very similar stories to tell about life trajectories. and. The different countries that I go to, for example, a group of interviews that I did um, in Georgia, in Atlanta, uh, in the States, where I spoke to African-American women who had, they told me that they had literally been trained from birth to be prostituted, that such was the violence and poverty um, in their neighborhoods, that they were seen as a cash cow, they were seen as collateral and indefinite um you know we need to link that what those women told me with the stories that we hear from um for example thailand where um gary glitter the child abuser used to holiday in phuket and he would buy eight-year-olds to rape from the parent mm. and there was this shock horror across much of the media rightly so but as though somehow what's happening in Thailand to those children isn't very similar to what's happening to those women who are being abused by white men in African-American ghettos in the States, in, in the most privileged country 
on the planet. So you and, and meeting indigenous women in, in, in Canada, in Australia and New Zealand, and the women that were racialized and used by the Johns and interviewing the punters who tell me about their shopping lists of particular minoritized women, particular um, races and ethnicities of women that they can abuse in particularly hellish ways. How is it when we know all of this, because there's enough sex trade survivors writing and speaking about this who are experts, how is it that anyone that calls themselves a socialist or an anti-racist activist can support this industry? Because there are one or two like Brooke Magnanti who are white and privileged and being a tourist in and out of prostitution to fund a PhD. How can they defend that industry and still call themselves intersectional feminists? No, it's absolutely disgraceful. And when you look at the racialized um, categories of porn in particular, um, the race play, the master slave dynamics, the KKK costumes, it's absolutely horrifying. All of the kind of horrific acts of violence and the prejudices that are allowed to flourish because men can masturbate over them. It's disgusting. Right. And, and why is it, you know, a, a question for feminists that we ask ourselves all the time when we dare is why do men get sexually excited at watching women be tortured and abused? Why? Who are these men? So if you've got white men um, masturbating um, to the images or the actual, um, whether it's role play or whether those women are, women are being technically forced, as opposed to forced through socialization, uh, where they're playing out Holocaust or, or slave trade scenes, these white men who will possibly fancy themselves to be quite decent and, um, and of course would be horrified if you said to them, this is psychotically racist as well as misogynistic, because they have looked at pornography and they've been given permission to see it as though it's almost a cartoon strip, mm. as opposed to real women being forced to endure real scenarios. Mm, it does, it really does dehumanise because I think the men consuming these images without a thought for the women undergoing this violence, they, they don't see those women or any other women by extension as human beings, just objects to mm. use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, you know, these the same men would, would rail, rightly so, against the tobacco trade and its advertising and its capturing of, of children. It, it's, it's incredible that they just defend, I mean, properly defend. Look, I've got to use this example, uh, much as it pains me to utter his name, Owen Jones. Go for it. Oh, no. I'm sorry, everybody, on this um, webinar. M my apologies. But, you know, he, we all know what he presents himself as. And he wrote a column in The Guardian, I can't remember when, but in recent years, about these three judges uh, from a high court who were sacked because they had been found to be watching pornography in court time, are you with me? Now we all know that men do not just sit here going, oh, that's interesting. They're tossing off, right? Yeah, yeah. So he said, look, come on, everyone watches porn. Why are we stigmatizing these men? And he said- Who's this everyone? <laughs> seriously, he said, and this is supposed to be a socialist. And remember, he has no doubt jumped on the you're all carceral feminists um, <laughs> route, you know, where where judges are probably seen as as evil, um, evil individuals in the war against any policing of male violence and any prisons to contain very dangerous men. But he, he actually said, what's the harm anyway? I'm paraphrasing, but you can read it. It's easy to find. And I'll link to it in the index. Because actually, maybe releasing a bit of tension will mean that these judges do a better job in sentencing and indeed oh, in the case. 
what I find so mind-boggling about that is he knows those judges are consuming pornography, but he doesn't think to question, how does this affect the judgments for women, in particular women trying to flee male violence through the courts? How does that shape their experiences? How does that misogyny shape the judges' perception and treatment of women? Oh, but no, I mean, it's all what, about the men. What, one, of the, one of the things we talked about, Claire, and you were extremely helpful with, was when I was researching the book and I, I said to you, look, can I ask you your views on the new buzz phrase that's going around, the carceral feminist buzz phrase, which I'm sure that most people on this um, session understand what, what that is, but it's used by academics like Alison Phipps and, and many others. And I'm going to talk about their view of it um, as mm -hmm. distinct from the views and the politics of um, black civil rights leaders, um, who are looking critically, rightly so, at the US prison system, which were basically holding pens for black men and black women um, who certainly shouldn't be there. And the way that the system works against people of color in the States and to an extent here, of course. But you know, some of these academics have taken it upon themselves to accuse those of us that have worked to try to reform the criminal justice system in order to deter men from continuing to abuse and kill women and also to look at women who defend themselves against male violence with um, sympathy and understanding and those of us that do this work on male violence clearly we have to reform the criminal justice system and we've been doing this for decades because it's not fit for purpose so whilst we're also campaigning to get women out of prison who shouldn't be in there, we're also saying, look, there are really dangerous men, whether it's John Warboys or Colin Pitchfork or any men that really, really are not going to stop abusing women unless they're contained. But, and, and particularly those of us that have in, in recent decades been saying, we need to criminalize the men who pay for sex as they've done in many countries now, thanks to feminist campaigning. Apparently, we're carceral feminists who just want prisons to be full of black men who've committed no crime. Um, when, in fact, we would empty the prisons of most people, including many, many. Yes, men. yes, absolutely. But we want some of them in there because they won't stop raping and killing us. That's the mm -hmm. dilemma. Now, you really you really spoke so eloquently to that when when um, when we had this discussion about it. And I, I'd love to hear from you how we're going to get through this kind of mess of the accusations towards feminists that are trying to stop male violence of carceral feminism, because it is an accusation of racism. It is, it is. And oh, it's such a difficult issue because absolutely, like you say, racism and classism play a huge part in determining not only who is criminalized, but to what extent they're criminalized. But at the same time, like Angela Davis, for example, I think um, you mentioned this from our interview in your book, but Angela Davis has written some really quite excellent stuff about how anti-blackness works in the prison system in the United States. And it's a very thorough analysis, except for the issue that she never really meaningfully engages with how many um, how many women within the prison system have have themselves been victims of male violence and then also the issue of what we do with the perpetrators of male violence against women and children because I'm not I don't want them to be in prison, you know, just because like, I believe locking people up is the best solution. I want them to be in prison to protect women and children okay. and to stop them seeking out either previous victims or future victims. You know, it's, it's a practical step in terms of prevention rather than because we believe in hardcore punishment. Mm -hmm. And for me, this whole argument of, oh, you're a carceral feminist if you believe that rapists should be locked up. Well, what do these people suggest that we actually do with rapists and the perpetrators of domestic violence? Do we just let them, you know, walk around the streets? Do we 
attach no consequences to those actions because if we don't penalize them it's going to keep happening I don't know it's it's difficult because I've never I have tried to engage with um, prison abolitionist feminists, particularly um, black feminists who take this stance, but I've never once had a satisfying answer mm. in terms of what we do to stop men hurting women when we know, we absolutely know the figures bear out that they reoffend. What do we do in that situation? Yeah, it's, it's a good question, isn't it? Because I mean, one, obviously one answer is radical major reform of the prison service. It should not be there for punishment. It should be there for containment. And prisoners um, are treated like scum. And there is, and, and this of course is perpetuated by the relentless war by some of the tabloid newspapers um, about they get three meals a day. They've even got a TV. I mean, inhumane treatment. I don't care who they are. This is inhumane treatment. And on the other hand, community solutions. Well, what on earth does that mean for men who have impunity? Why would men who have literally no feelings of human kindness or empathy towards women, who enjoy inflicting harm on us, why on earth would they sit around in a circle talking about how their hurt feelings has caused them to torture women? and being persuaded not to do it and I was at um, a really interesting meeting in Vancouver three or four years ago um, sitting on a panel with um, the formidable Lee Lakeman who is one of my feminist heroes she's she's an absolutely amazing woman been with Vancouver Rape Relief for a long long time before she she calls it retired she's anything but but she was, she was, I think, either chairing or speaking at a session about building bridges with, um, between um, indigenous native um, women uh, and, and non-native women in the city and across, across, the, um, across Canada. And there was a brilliant activist, indigenous activist called Faye Blaney, who was there, who was saying, we want to stop men from abusing our girls and women. And the police obviously do that relativist thing of, well, we can't, you know, they police themselves, you know, like rabbinical courts or Sharia courts or whatever. So it's the same old bullshit about, well, you know, they have their leaders. In other words, we can't be asked going in and protecting these women and girls. And Faye said uh, to Lee, when Lee was talking about her, you know, what, what do we do about these men? And some of them absolutely just have to go to prison. And, and Faye was saying, yes, but we don't want the police to come in to the reservations and just pick up men who they don't like because they're indigenous men and they've caused them a bit of grief or they've got a bad attitude and just put them in prison because prisons are full of these men. And that isn't the solution for our community. We need to be able to look at which men cannot be monitored and contained, where women and girls cannot be protected, and those that absolutely will not be, um, be managed, you have to send them away. And I mean, this is a woman who is deeply critical of the prison system because her people populate the prisons um, yeah. around Vancouver. Absolutely. It's... Um... Oh, it's so difficult. And then you're presented with the idea of restorative justice where the, <laughs> you're laughing. <laughs> I know it's such a crock of shit, but the idea that the, the perpetrator is somehow going to make amends to the victim. And like, as soon as people mention this, I think, do you not see what a massive safeguarding issue this is? Because you're, pre you're presenting the um, perpetrator an opportunity to manipulate and psychologically torture the victim. And this already happens um, when like in cases of domestic violence where children are involved and they're sent to mediation by the judge and you know exactly what's going to happen there. And it's, it's consistently women um, as victims of male violence who are let down by these well, I can't even call them solutions, but mm -hmm. these scenarios. Yeah, I mean, the, the, new, the new guard um, 
at the uh, feminist library here in London um, are, you know, put out a statement saying, you another know, one. Yeah, well, it's probably the same one. Same old, same old, saying that we will not, um, you know, we are not, we are anti-carceral. We will not call the police um, to resolve any issues. We will basically resolve it uh, with community solutions. And I was thinking to myself, okay, so some bloke goes into the library and rapes a woman. What's yeah. that condition going to look like? Because at the moment, men think they can rape women and get away with it because they almost all can. Yeah. Because we've got, you know, a shockingly low conviction rape, uh, conviction rate for rape, shockingly low. And also, um, you know, the likes of John Warboys, the so-called black cab rapist, who convinced a parole board that he was safe to get out, having not even coughed up to the hundreds of other rapes he had committed and just managed to kind of learn the language on the sex offender course that he was on. And I have to give a shout out to Harriet Wistrich here, who, um, you know, is the brilliant lawyer who represented some of, of Warboy's victims and who fought um, on their behalf with those women to reverse that parole board decision and to highlight the madness on which it was based. And one interesting thing, of course, that was discovered during their campaign for the women, and he is safely back in Chokey, thankfully, um, was that men who go on sex offender treatment courses in prison are slightly more likely to re-offend when they get out than the men who didn't go on such courses. For what decades, a shock. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. For decades, I've been looking at so-called perpetrator programs for, for men who commit acts of domestic violence and abuse. And I'm just shocked and appalled at the way that some women have set the bar so low uh, that a limbo dancer would have a bit of trouble with it by saying that, you know, well, at least some men stop, you know, punching their wives in the face so that they've got visible injuries and some of them kind of take five and go to anger management and walk out of the room instead of beating her up. I mean, this we shouldn't be we, we shouldn't be looking at the kind of best case scenario within a violent relationship that women are in and and saying that he should be not even considered um, by the criminal justice system that he should just go straight on some kind of re-education course it's bullshit i know i ran one of them as an experiment for, for curb crawlers for men uh, who were picking up prostituted women back in the late 90s with the formidable um, Fiona Broadfoot, with Jalna Hanma, uh, other feminists, where we said to the police, stop arresting the women just for one year, a pilot scheme, um, arrest, the, say to the men that they'll be in court unless they come to our re-education school, which was like an all-day caution. And we talked to them while, while they were in the room and you know we we heard their excuses and we heard what they had to say about it and they have no remorse none mm. at all so you have to dangle some kind of consequence in front of them that will cost them something mm, their freedom their respect yeah their liberty even it's it's difficult it's it's such a difficult thing because <laughs> I think we even, well, not within the feminist community, but within mainstream society, women are absolutely treated as disposable in a way that is completely affirmed by the judiciary and its responses or lack of adequate responses to mm. men's violence, which is just systemic, widespread. So what do we do? I mean, this is- Shoot the men. Yeah, I mean, we're, we, we're going to have to go around and we're going to have to form vigilante gangs. And if we can't do that, because that's my that's my best fantasy in, in low moments. But we are, as we know, the most optimistic movement on the planet because we don't believe that any of this stuff is inevitable. And we don't believe that men are pre-programmed to harm women or to seek power over us. And we know that we the, the women's movement has achieved so, so much. I mean, we have got the issue of men's violence against women and girls on the agenda wherever we do this campaigning from Algeria um, to, to, to Iraq 
uh, to Cambodia, to everywhere where we know that there are vibrant feminist movements, which is all over the world, even in Saudi Arabia, that, that women are fighting against patriarchy and having an end goal, which is to free the world of male violence. Because, you know, my argument is it's the only thing that unites women and girls everywhere. But it's a major thing. It's major because we're all curtailed by it. Mm. Some of us are damn sight more than others. But even those of us, the few women on the planet that haven't had a direct experience of male violence, we fear it. We, it's, 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 it's in our DNA. You know, we, we control our behavior. We curtail it. We blame ourselves. We fear it constantly. And we have to tell our daughters that we have to warn them about it. And this is a disgrace. So I just think that if, Yes, it's absolutely the case that many things divide us. But in order to seek solidarity as a women's movement, we have to, as Pragna Patel said at my launch the other day, um, at the, the physical launch, we have to work on the basis of need. What do women need as a collective movement? Well, we need to end male violence so that we can be liberated. And it's a, it's a big job, but we have to imagine a world without that violence in it. We have to. The word you use in feminism for women, and I, I find this quite inspiring, was utopia. And you did, you ended on a very positive note, and you were talking about the optimism inherent to feminism. And there was something that really struck a chord with me because you were talking about how feminism is the only movement, the only political movement that does not see men's violence against women and children as inevitable it absolutely doesn't think men are like predetermined abusers and that just contrasts so completely with the idea of the man-hating radical feminist doesn't it it does but you know we really should hate men a damn sight more than we do <laughs> I mean, why don't we all really hate men for what they do to us and the women we love and the girls that we love and cherish what on earth is it that keeps us from from have holding extraordinary levels of hatred and clearly it's because you don't get stuff done if you're consumed by hatred but i do hate the things that men do and i absolutely hate patriarchy but it also comes back full circle again isn't it to women are the only oppressed group on the planet required to love their oppressors and that's why there's so many women who do collude in our own oppression to do the job of patriarchy for them, which is what makes feminism deeply complicated and unpopular. Mm. And, you know, and that's also what gives ammunition to the anti-feminists who say, well, women do it too. Well, yeah, but women don't benefit from this. So the central question that I ask throughout the book is, what kind of feminism do we want? Do we want a feminism that benefits men more than it does women? Because that's what we've got at the moment coming out of universities and in the mainstream. Or do we want a feminism that moves us further to liberation? Do we want a feminism for women? And I was asked yesterday on a radio programme, that's an odd title, isn't it? What else would feminism be for? And I said, yeah, you're right, it is. Because we do have a feminism that benefits men right now. That's why men are not threatened by it. That's why so many men are declaring themselves to be feminists and telling us what we should think, feel and say about issues such as prostitution, about issues such as the sex offender, the male sex offender in the wee spa in LA. We're being told by these men that we're bigots because we are speaking out against male violence and all they can do is defend the status quo and so many women are capitulating to that so we have mm. to have to think about why is male approval so persuasive why is it so intoxicating because so many straight feminist friends of mine have got over that whole male approval thing they they don't care now they no longer seek it I think it connects really quite deeply back to how how femininity is socialized within us because we are taught that that's absolutely the yardstick by which we should measure our worth whether men perceive us as attractive useful to them desirable whatever and 
It is. It's a challenge to unlearn when we are fed that message so aggressively from birth. But I think, well, there are a wealth of radical feminist texts and resources, such as Feminism for Women, that will definitely help undo at least some of the patriarchal brainwashing we are subjected to. Well, Claire, you're an absolute star. Um, I'm so thrilled to see, you know, women um, messaging from so many parts of the world, so many different countries. It's, it's really cool. Me. It's brilliant. And also so many women whose names I've heard of, whose activism I know of, so many old and new friends. And I think, you know, it's, it's something that we need to bear in mind that we are a movement. Uh, Women's Place UK um, has really brought women together and revitalized our movement in so many ways. And I just want to thank, uh, thank you for doing that. And thank you for, for hosting this. Um, and of course, you know, let's carry on the conversation. I'm deeply grateful to you, Claire, and for, for your work and, and for tonight. Um, and oh, I, I really hope sure. we carry on. That means a lot. It has been a pleasure and a privilege to do this with you. And if anybody doesn't have your copy, Feminism for Women is now available in all good bookstores. So please do buy it and read it. As you will see from my own copy, my own extensively highlighted copy, <laughs> I got a lot from it and you will too. So happy reading everyone and speedy recovery, Julie. I hope Thank that you. You and Harriet get over the COVID quickly. Thank you very much and please let's see an end to this bloody virus. Oh, the God, yes. violence one as well as the COVID one. <laughs> no, so